It was a regular day like any other day. Actually, it was beautiful like it is here today. It was a beautiful morning. The sky was blue. It was a beautiful, clear, sunny, crisp day. Warm, crisp, clear air. There wasn't a smog around. Everything was visible. I'm Judge Fern Fisher. It's my distinct honor to introduce this reflective video dedicated to the memories of the three court officers that the court system lost in the World Trade Center disaster on September 11th, 2001. There's been two points of my life which I consider to be extremely low and where I felt extremely powerless. The death of my mother and September 11th, 2001. On that day, I was in Albany at a conference with most of the other court administrators. I was having a cup of coffee when I heard about the first plane. Thereafter, we figured out it was terrorism, and the first thing that occurred to me, what was happening to my family back in civil court. I felt like I could do nothing to help. We learned shortly thereafter that three court officers were lost that members of our civil court family lost fathers and sons and cousins and friends. I'm Mickey Shearer, and I'm very proud to have been asked with Judge Fisher to introduce this video, which memorializes the events of September 11th and its impact upon our court family. This gives me another opportunity to say again how proud I am of the extraordinary valor, heroism, and humanity displayed by our employees. This video is a tribute to those values. I got up, it was dark, rather cool morning. The birds were singing beautifully. Took the bus to Port Authority, the train to Canal Street, and walked to the courthouse. I was in the locker room on the 14th floor at 100 Center Street with my brother and my brother officers, and we were having our breakfast there. And suddenly we heard a loud explosion. We all went to the window, and we had an unobstructed view of the World Trade Center, the Twin Towers, and we saw one tower was on fire. Well, old breakfast is forgotten now, and we're wondering what has happened. And uh, about 15 minutes later, we noticed an airplane flying very low. And we're looking, and next thing we knew, that plane flew right into the second tower. And it was at that point that we knew we were under attack. Major Reginald Mabane commandeered a couple of jury buses, and a number of officers rushed down to go down to the World Trade Center to lend assistance. On September 11th, uh, as we approached the site, we approached from the north, coming south, as you can see behind the cranes here on West Broadway. Uh, we traveled south on West Broadway and we left our bus about three blocks away. At that time, we assisted the NYPD in crowd control, uh, trying to push everyone back past Canal Street. I received a call over my radio that they needed, that we were bringing out casualties out of Building 5 and that they needed assistance. I gathered the officers that had come down with me of the total of 11 at that time. Officers were uh, assisting carrying those that were uh, injured. And, and as you can see, as uh, people were coming from further up the towers, the uh, injuries uh, seemed to get more and more severe. There were head injuries, uh, broken bones, uh, burns started to see. 
I saw uh, Tommy Jurgens, Officer Tommy Jurgens, and uh, Officer Mitch Wallace, and uh, Captain Harry Thompson repeatedly run into the building and help carry out uh, injured from the concourse level under Five World Trade. We did have some communication with Officer Jurgens. It was very brief, but that was cut short at that time. Uh, while standing there at the fire truck, uh, we were told that we had to leave the area very quickly. Uh, what happened was the second tower had started coming down. In the minutes tick by, there was a call over the radio that uh, another plane hit from another side. And at that point, there was no doubt in our minds that it was a terrorist attack. It was, there was no mistaking it, 100% certain. And it was a shame that so many people died, but we are still grieving for our colleagues and our comrades because they were really close friends. We socialized together, we spent a lot of time together outside of here. And they were really exemplary officers and exemplary human beings. And I'm not saying that just because they're gone, because it was true. They would help out whenever you needed help without even saying one word, they would just come by and give you a hand. They turn around, somebody else needed a hand, whether it was their job or not, they would just go over and give them a hand. They were, it was a privilege to know these guys, it really was. We were in our office on the 12th floor and all of a sudden we heard this huge explosion and the whole building shook and we jumped up and decided to go see what had happened. So we, we ran up the stairs here and came and to this exact spot where we're standing right. now. And you can see the buildings back here in the back there. They used to tower over that red right. building and the federal building right on the top. You can see them. A clear view of Really, of the really building. tall. Right. And the first thing we saw was a huge hole in one of the towers and smoke just pouring out the top of it. And papers, lots of paper, pa paper flying all over the place. Paper and smoke and the second plane hit. We saw About the plane and we were looking at the building and it just like this big ball of fire out of the side of the building. Mm -hmm. And there was a oh. And then we knew something then was knew. terribly wrong. Yeah. This was this was no accident. I was coming out of the AC and E line at Canal Street and coming up the stairs. There were people pointing up at the sky. There was just typical New York tourists. Um, and I noticed the gaping hole in the building and someone said a plane had hit. Uh, so at that point I was just kind of staring, looking at it, seeing what was going on. And I started walking to work down, I got to Broadway. It's when the second plane had just hit. It was a pretty big loud boom. At that point I ran into the building. and. You know, we're kind of just wondering what happened, but we knew it was terroristic at that point, considering two planes had hit the two separate buildings, was our assumption. Um, we all went to our courtrooms and kind of just waiting for word to evacuate or what the next step was. So we had to wait for Albany to get the go-ahead. Um, we closed all courtrooms, got everyone out of the building. Most employees had gone home if they could, and what, I think room 107 was kind of a waiting area for anyone who wanted to wait in the building. Uh, I decided to come in the next day to try and help, you know, dig or whatever help they could use. I know Tommy was missing. Um, that's when they had told me that morning that Harry and, and Mitch was missing as well, which was a shock. Here's engine 279 stretching a hose line into the World Financial Center building. Both water mains feeding downtown Manhattan were destroyed by the collapses of the Twin Towers. A worker came out of the financial building and told the firefighters that there was a water tower that was loaded up on the roof if you wanted water. My name is Steve Spack. I'm an associate court clerk with the Civil Court City of New York. I work in Kings County and I'm in charge of the calendar department. On 9-11, I happened to be off that day. Uh, I was off for two weeks. My wife had a baby girl on September 7th. So I was home taking care of the baby, helping my wife. Uh, on 9-11, I responded from Whitestone, Queens to the scene of the World Trade Center. And I am lucky I got there after both buildings had previously collapsed. I continued down the Liberty Street. There was firemen milling around. And then right on Liberty and Broadway, I could see what was 
it was looked like a part of a skeleton, but there was a lot of smoke, and it was just incredible. I'm looking for a collapsed area, and there was really, I didn't see that much debris, other than the streets being filled with papers, and everything was like an ashen gray, like this fine powder all over the place, and pieces of metal strewn about. And to the right was the north bridge that was collapsed, and, and part of it collapsed on the cab of Rescue Company 1. And there were damaged fire trucks and overturned vehicles all over the place. It was, uh, it looked like something out of a, a, a war movie. It was just incredible. And the firefighters were milling around. Here's, this is West Street right here. That's the North Bridge. And to the left of that is the Custom House, number six. The North Tower would have been right where ladder, up front of Ladder 5 and where the North Bridge was. And if you look up there, it's just smoke. You know, you see them with some water they had, probably from the fireboat. And this was taken probably, at this point, about a, probably a half hour from uh, when the buildings collapsed. And it was total disarray, and uh, they were doing the best they could. And I knew a lot of people were lost just by looking at this thing. A lot of firemen were missing. I knew it was bad. I knew it was real bad, but I didn't really know exactly what the, you know, the final count would be. And, you know, it was just a total destructive, incredible sight. After I'd heard that two planes had hit into the World Trade Center, I headed downtown. Already thousands of people were on these streets making a, a mass exodus uptown to get away from what would soon be called Ground Zero. I continued downtown along Nassau Street and when I ended up around here, all of a sudden I heard a rumbling sound and a lot of people screaming. I looked behind me and I could see this dust cloud billowing at me incredibly fast. They're saying like 60 miles an hour. So I did the only thing I could think to do, which was run. This is the wall that I went to when the cloud enveloped me. I stayed there a few, a few moments trying to catch my breath, and I could hear the bells of Trinity Church in the distance. There was a woman next to me sobbing, so I, I made my way over to her to tell her that everything was going to be okay, even though I wasn't sure at that moment if things really were going to be okay. But then I heard voices coming from down the block, and I took her hand and made my way over down to those voices. Everything was in darkness, lit only by the street lights that had gone on, sensing the darkness that had been caused by the dust cloud. Uh, we followed our way down here until we made it to this Charles Schwab office over here, going inside for sanctuary where people offered us bottles of water and towards the sink where we were able to wash off and wait for the dust cloud to settle. Starting our day as we normally do, setting up for the day's training classes, uh, when we heard a loud explosion, and some of us started to wonder what it was, those of us that were in the main uh, training room. And then uh, one of the staff instructors came in and said that a plane uh, had just struck the World Trade Center. And uh, several of the members of the staff, Sergeant Al Mascola, uh, Patricia Mayorino, we ran into the men's locker room where we noticed smoke billowing out of the uh, North Tower. It was at that point I decided that uh, I would respond with Sergeants Al Mascola and Sergeant Andrew Wender. Uh, we saw people all over the place. We saw uh, jet fuel everywhere. There was glass. There were people screaming and yelling. And the amount of devastation already was just unbelievable. We started to make our way up uh, on the stairwells, assisting other firefighters as the streams of people were making their way down the steps. Uh, we made our way up to the 19th floor where we saw a whole bunch of firefighters uh, mustering up on the corridors on the 19th floor. And it was at this point that we continued uh, our ascent into the uh, North Tower. Uh, we continued all our way up until we uh, reached the 51st floor and uh, clearing hundreds of people. And uh, the people were very gracious. M many people were telling us that, you know, God bless you for coming in. People were trying their cell phones. I remember no cell phones worked. Our Nextels weren't working properly. We're having a hard time uh, 
communicating with uh, the academy. But while we were up there, the second plane had hit, and uh, we don't know exactly what happened, but we felt our building shake, and uh, shortly thereafter, we uh, what was the South Tower collapsing? Uh, we, like I said, we couldn't see what was happening, but we knew that it was time to get down. Well, the rest of the staff, and myself, were actually watching from the locker room. Uh, we actually saw the second plane come down and hit the towers. At that point, and only at that point, did we all realize that this was not just a tragic accident, that this was actually a terrorist attack. Uh, so what I did is I dismissed the class and I informed the class if anyone wanted to join us that the rest of the staff was going down to the uh, World Trade Center uh, and try to assist any way we can. Uh, <clears throat> at that point, myself, Captain Harry Thompson, Sergeant Mayorino, Sergeant Nate Grant, and other uh, officers from the class proceeded down to the site. We just fell into line and started working with the rest of the uh, officers at the scene, police officers, firefighters, EMS, Port Authority, uh, anybody that had a uniform was down there doing the job, trying to get the people out. And the people were coming down from way up, who knows what floors, no shoes, uh, you know, burned, wet, bleeding, some of them in shock. and. Um, we were just trying to help them, you know, get out and get as far away from there as we could. While we were there, we heard a report. I was standing next to a police officer. He got a report that there was a third plane headed towards the World Trade Center. So I radioed uh, the guys up in the tower. Between them, they have uh, six, ten children, and I'm thinking they got to get out of there. You know, they have to come down. I mean, there's just no way they could stay up there with a third plane heading their way. While I was outside the door, we heard the very loud noise. It was like an avalanche sound that you'd hear in a, in a movie. And I looked up, the sky was turning black, and didn't have time to think. Me and the other officers ran inside Building 5, and it was extremely loud noise. You know, it shook your whole body, your lungs, everything. We got inside, the rubble was coming down, and where we ran inside was a lobby. It was a glass door. It's a glass encased lobby. And while we were there, when the stuff came down, we were totally, totally trapped by debris. And what we didn't realize at the time was that when they were getting trapped in the Five World Trade Center, um, that's when the South Tower actually had collapsed. And we were up on the 51st floor when that happened. And again, not knowing that the South Tower had collapsed, as Andrew said earlier, we decided to descend from the 51st floor. Truly a tragedy that our, our captain and co-worker Harry Thompson isn't here with us and Tommy Jurgens and Mitch Wallace, but it's a miracle that, that we were spared. Uh, it's like everyone said, uh, as we're running up the steps in, in the towers to try to help people, the second plane hit and uh, we made it through that. And while we were up on the 51st floor, the South Tower fell down and, and we made it through that. We made it down to the lobby and then the building on top of us started to collapse and it was only seconds after we were right outside that it fell down and uh, again we were lucky enough like Al said you can't outrun one of the towers of the World Trade Center so uh, miraculously it didn't fall on us when it, it a few minutes later when the dust finally did clear up enough for us to get up and uh, I, I remember hearing the chief directing us into what turned out to be a bagel shop, I, I remember saying to myself, I can't believe how close this bagel shop was, and, and uh, I don't even remember seeing it while we were running, but it seemed to only be a few steps away when everything did clear, and uh, it, it seemed to be pretty much intact uh, other than the debris, and if just some more people could have made it there, it, it would have been... Uh, you know, a, a lot better for them.
I got to the courthouse, and as I drove into the garage, Officer Jurgens was there, as he usually was, patrolling the outside of White Street. I waved to him, and he waved at me. It was not until five after nine that I received a telephone call from Zoe London, a court attorney in Kings County, and she was frantic because of what was happening and wanted to know if we were all all right in the court. I immediately went up to the 12th floor where I learned that I was one of the ranking judges here in the courthouse that day. And we were all consulting with the clerks, the captains, etc., so that we could have an orderly uh, evacuation of the building. The evacuation was in fact orderly. I did stay until approximately noon, at which point they told me that there was nothing left for me to do and that I should go home. I did. I was numb. I'm still numb in my heart when I think about it, although it never leaves my mind. I'm sitting here today and I happen to be wearing the exact same suit, the exact same shirt, and the exact same tie that I was wearing on September 11th. September 11th was a normal school day, typical day for my son and I um, taking the number one train down to school. He's at Chambers and Greenwich Street, PS 234, and um, we were running late. <laughs> he was upset about it, and um, by the time we got there, his class had already gone upstairs, and you know, I'd kiss him goodbye and have a good day, and was walking up Chambers. I was in one quarter of the way up the block when I heard that plane and within seconds it hit and I couldn't see because I was already out of sight of the school and um, I ran back around and there it was like right in the world trade and um, ran upstairs to my son's class they didn't even know what had happened really um, they had heard it they had felt it shake and uh, my son's classroom looks right out on it. It's, his class is right there, and it looks right out on it. So, you know, the teachers were pulling it down. You know, and the kids, you could start seeing them getting scared. And, um, but, you know, all of us parents that were in there, we just really thought, okay, you know, it's an accident. It looks like something that, you know, emergency services would be able to take care of. And we were ready to leave our kids. We were going to leave our kids there in that school, you know. And I went back outside. That's when the second plane had hit. I didn't see it, but just seeing everybody running, you turn around to see what it was, and that's when the second plane had hit. And we all knew then that it was definitely not an accident. You know, I grabbed my son and, you know, I just kissed all the other ones that were left, and we ran. And uh, my son was like a rock. He was very cool, and I was hysterical. And I ran up Greenwich. We ran up Greenwich to about Reed Street, and then we cut over. And then when we got to West Broadway, I saw our jury bus, our jury bus coming down the block. And then I knew that, you know, some of our, I knew it was the officers that some of our people from the course were going down to help. And as part of my everyday commute, I would go through the World Trade Center. And it, it became an integral part of my daily routine. Places, the shops there you would use, Starbucks, the Kelly Photo Lab, all of these became part of a daily routine. You would pass by the daycare center, see all the babies, the children playing, and then one day it was gone, all of it. In a matter of minutes, gone, everything. So the destruction at the Trade Center left a lasting impression on me. And I decided one night, after working a shift, when we were doing 24-7 security to go down to the site and do some work at nighttime. And one thing about night is that it brings everything much more into focus. And the sheer horror of the scene at night really took a toll on you. I was there one night for five hours. The only thing anyone found while I was there was an identification card for a worker. It was found by someone next to me, an EMT from upstate. She turned it over to the crime scene because that's what it was, a crime scene. And unfortunately, 
the whole night I was there, no one found anything except that one solitary card with, to me, still an anonymous face, but to someone else, a loved one. And I can only hope that whoever found this card eventually got it to the family of the guy it belonged to. And maybe that's the only memorial this man and his family has, is that single, solitary ID card. On our first weekend uh, after 9-11, I, I was basically consumed with, it, with the desire to do something to recognize all those that had fallen, you know, especially our, our own. And I started to put together a, a slideshow. Uh, it's a PowerPoint presentation, and I reached out to as many people as I know uh, to send me pictures of 9-11, of, of what happened, uh, of departments working uh, at the site, and uh, the, the response was pretty good. And I put all those pictures into a slideshow and put it to music. Then the idea came that we should do something here uh, at 111. And what I wanted to do was something that would be able to last. And uh, the slideshow itself didn't seem appropriate. Uh, so we, we started a discussion. Uh, we, we thought about putting up a, a bronze bust or, or a plaque or something along those lines. And uh, then we found out about uh, the Rose Brothers, uh, these artists that uh, seem to do a lot of work for the city. This idea started back in November, December, and uh, uh, there were a lot of obstacles to getting it done. And we were able to surmount all those obstacles. And uh, the Rose Brothers were on the side, ready to start work. The second we were able to, to start, and uh, as you know, it's, we were able to start work only a few weeks ago. And uh, the canvas went up, and the next day, basically, the Rose Brothers were in painting. And uh, they've been painting since then. Thompson was my co-captain at that time, and uh, myself and Harry, plus the officers, we went down there together, and I believe Sergeant Mayorino said uh, about some of us going to the right and some of us going to the left. Well, what I remember that day is myself and Harry was standing on the corner of Church Street when we got there, and uh, Harry, I went to the straight across, and Harry moved over to the left, and I always remember myself thinking about, uh, you know, it could have been very easily myself going over to the other side, and Harry, the one that's left standing, and I guess what it did, it uh, made me uh, think about Harry a lot more, and who he was, and how spiritual Harry was, and, uh, uh, and a lot of his philosophy was about enjoying, uh, you know, this whole ride, you know. Life is a journey. Life is a journey yeah. Yeah. We are very rare because we did a interview with Queens Public Television about surviving the tower falling and being inside when it happened and, and assisting with the rescue of so many thousands of people. And I asked the officer that did the interview where the other survivors were, and she said, there aren't any. You know, you're the only people, rescuers, that were in there that got out, and I know there are some other uh, firemen that were in an elevator, and there's, there's a few here or there, but basically as a whole, we were very, very lucky to survive. I'm very, very thankful that I survived, and I just wish more people could have survived. And I pray every day that uh, somehow uh, the country will continue on and that we never suffer a tragedy like this ever again. It, just, it, it was a very bad experience, I mean. Uh, yeah. To this day, when yep. I drive in in the morning, when we drive we, in, we in the morning. We drive in in the morning, and every, every day, day every we day. pass where the trade centers were. And you miss and it, you, you know? You, you can't help but think about it every single day, and it just hurts my heart. The reason I came to 111 was because of Captain Harry Thompson, whom I was sorely missed. 
Mitchell Wallace was my relief during lunch hour. And Tommy was always the slender kid standing on the corner doing his security patrol. Those vivid memories will live with me for the rest of my life and I hope they're in a better place. But I'll represent them here on this earth as well as me and many of my colleagues. To ever be in my heart. When you walk through a storm, hold your head up high and don't be afraid of the dark. At the end of a storm is a golden sky and the sweet silver song of a lark. Walk on through the wind, walk on through the rain, though your dreams be tossed and blown. Walk on, walk on, with hope in your heart, and you'll never walk alone. You'll never walk alone.